Hi, I'm Sue Ming Ku, and I'm at the uh, School of Political Science and Sociology at the National University of Ireland, Galway. And today I'm going to give you the short lecture on colonial extraction and dispossession. So the historical development of the modern capitalist world economy systematically bound colonizers and colonized into unequal relationships of extraction, colonization, and dispossession over the past 500 years and more. Material realities are central to understanding what we mean by colonization of materials, of life, and labor. Colonialism occupies land and turns people into, and nature into human and natural resources for a singular aim, the accumulation of capital. Historical processes of extraction, dispossession, replacement, and extinction drove colonization and ecological imperialism as structural imperatives of modern capitalism. Land grabbing, wars, and slavery connect with the extensive spread of commercial monocultures as economic structures. These displace and threaten much of the world's human, biological, and cultural life with extinction. Law and conservation have colluded in these colonizing processes, emptying lands and displacing or dispossessing indigenous nature and people in order that the material resources can continue to be extracted, monetized, and mobilized for the accumulation of capital. This lecture provides an introduction to thinking about the ways in which colonialism, resource extraction, and dispossession were materially connected in the historical making of the modern colonial capitalist world economy. This process formed the basis of neo-colonial globalization in current forms, expressed as neo-imperial commodity chains. A material approach brings into view the centrality of ecological factors and flows of matter, energy, and life. These are harnessed towards a single aim, the accumulation of profit or capital. The conversion of matter and life into resources is the central set of processes connecting capitalism and colonialism, yoking human and other than human elements into the creation of colonies and capital. A colony is not merely a formal political entity. It is the material form of unequal exchange and metabolic rifts that enable the creation of capital through dispossession, replacement, extinction, and inequalities. So starting with the so-called process of Columbian exchange of plants and animals, I re-describe this as a syndemic of extinction and replacement of forms of life. This lecture then moves to briefly discuss several connected aspects of colonialism. Colonial plantations replace pre-colonial nature culture relationships with monocultures that continuously require deforestation, slavery, drought, soil exhaustion, and the need for new lands. The legal definition of empty lands serves to dispossess the original inhabitants so that resources can be appropriated and extracted. Conservation arose as a movement to maintain resources in the name of nature while expelling and dispossessing local inhabitants. Material flows and metabolic rift continue unabated under current conditions of globalization intensifying the pressure for resources and continuing to result in neo-colonial land and resource grabbing. The so-called Columbian exchange was inaugurated by Columbus's avowed discovery. Conquest and European colonization of the Americas 
European conquistadors and colonists brought diseases, livestock, sugarcane, and slaves with them. And they returned back to Europe with silver, sugar, tobacco, and profits. When they could not force enough indigenous labor to make colonization efficient and profitable, they turned to the importation of slaves who themselves were violently extracted from Africa alongside other forms of forced and indentured labor. The diseases that invaders and slaves brought, like smallpox and measles, caused mass deaths for the indigenous population. Possibly over 80% of the local population died. So the 1500s were described as a time of mega deaths, but also mega droughts in the Americas. So there was um, an environmental crisis at the same time as the disease crisis. Smallpox and other important diseases like malaria or in yellow fever proved to be extremely fatal to the indigenous population who lacked immunity to these new diseases. The strains of war, malnutrition, deforestation, and this mega droughts also contributed to disease. A horrifying disease called Kokolitzli killed even more millions than the smallpox. When Hernan Cortes arrived in Mexico, the Aztec Empire's capital city, Tenochtitlan, was one of the largest cities in the world. It was at least twice the size of the largest imperial power, European imperial power cities like Las London or Lisbon. Tenochtitlan had about 22 million inhabitants. But by the end of that century, the 1500s, only 2 million remained. This word, a syndemic, describes several biological and social interactions that come together to increase susceptibility and worsen health outcomes. In the conquest and colonization, some factors such as military violence, forced labor, enslavement, and the immiserization of the local population, as well as species introduction, extinction, and deforestation can all be directly attributed to the conquerors, the conquistadors. But there were also unintentional factors like disease and pests, like the rats, mice, and lice that spread with the conquistadors. The indigenous Inca and Aztec empires also place their own pressures on indigenous subjects. The conquest was not so much an exchange as in the Colombian exchange, but really a cataclysm of invasion, death, and the transformation of nature and human relationships into violent relationships of extraction, dispossession, and civilizational collapse. So instead of an exchange, we might see European expansion and colonization in the Americas as a syndemic that establish flows of matter, energy, life, and pathogens to profit some while dispossessing and, and extinguishing others. Material flows made up the stuff of extraction, which came with and followed on from invasion and disease, while the burdens of harm and death were disproportionately borne by the indigenous people and environment in colonized lands. The most ex obvious example of extraction is literally money. Europeans needed money since they traded with Asia and had great demand for Asian goods, but the Asian powers had little demand for European goods. Thus, European traders needed gold or silver to buy Asian goods. After first looting their so-called discoveries, they found that they could extract money directly from mines. Very large silver mines were taken over in Potosí, in the Viceroyalty of Peru, now in Bolivia, in, and in Zacatecas and Guanajuato, in now uh, what is now northern Mexico. The Potosí mine in the Viceroyalty of Peru, to, in today's Bolivia, pro provided almost 60% of the world's silver in the 1500s. 
This very large amount of new world silver expanded the world's money supply and stimulated an early form of globalization with a big increase in global trade. This allowed the imperial powers of Europe to fund wars and finance imports from Southeast Asia and further afield. This injection of new world silver made the unit of currency, the real da oco, the, the peso, or uh, in English known as the piece of eight, uh, became the main international trading currency for 300 years and more. Now, the word colonialism derives from the Latin colonia. Uh, this term means lands given to citizens of the Roman Empire during the Roman Imperial period. These were frequently veteran soldiers who were given this land to settle, farm, occupy, but also to maintain and expand an imperial presence in newly conquered areas. So when you look at the Oxford Diction English Dictionary, you find that the history of the word in English says that colonization is first used to describe the colonization of Scotland by England. Then very quickly after that, the Spanish colonization in the Americas in the 1550s. So Magellan's voyages in the early 1500s proved that Columbus had not reached Asia, but um, as he thought by a different route, but they had found Abiyala or the new world. And so there they found money, mines and lands suitable for plantation. And they brought to plant their sugarcane the most valuable export crop at that time. Sugar was a very profitable and desirable item in medieval Europe. And this led the Portuguese and Spanish colonists to develop plantations in the Southern Mediterranean to begin with, in what are now the Madeira and Can Canary Islands in the late 1400s. But these became very quickly unsustainable because of deforestation, and the drought and climate change that came with deforestation. In fact, Madeira was called that, uh, meaning the island of wood. And this island of wood was deforested within a few decades. So the discovery of Brazil and the Caribbean islands in the so-called New World offered an alternative location for sugar production. Sugar being a very soil and water hungry and very highly labor intensive crop introduced from uh, Asia. Slave labor was extracted from Africa as well as indentured labor from Asia uh, together with forced native labor to make large scale labor intensive farming and processing of sugarcane efficient and profitable. Every single imported commodity that was important to the development of modern world capitalism dominated by Europe from the 1500s onward required wood. Uh, commodities like sugar, but also metal, ships and buildings. A single pound of sugar required something like 60 pounds of fuel wood to produce it, to boil the sap and to produce crystal sugar. So capitalist export products like sugar uh, in their production caused what is called a metabolic rift. Fast growing cane plants remove nutrients from the soil and they require other energy and materials hungry uh, uh, resources like wood, metal and slave labor to produce the sugar destined for a global market. So capitalist production uses a particular strategy of monoculture of certain kinds of varieties of life, they are called cultigens, devoting extensive areas to the single standard foreign crop. The capitalist quest to produce more and more agricultural commodities led to widespread soil depletion. If you look at sugar, it's a very demanding crop. Europe itself was already facing several ecological crises brought on by the development of capitalism, industry, and the rise of money. 
As urbanization and commercial crop production intensified in Europe, soil fertility declined. And this cre created a demand for mass imports of fertilizer from elsewhere. And these were in the form of guano or a mineral called chili saltpeter. The demand for a fertilizer in Europe led to a war in the Pacific, the Pacific War. This was when Chile invaded coastal Bolivia and Peru to grab its fertilizer resources. Chile grabbed Bolivia's entire coastline as well as Peru's guano islands to amass the world's most valuable fertilizer resources. The process of settlement and colonization relied not only on seizure and violent expropriation, but the operation of law itself to define and enforce property rights, linking a sense of what is just and proper to the transfer of lands and resources into colonial ownership. Racial ideology served to systematically embed white acquisition and domination to impose unconsented structures of law, norms, and customs of property ownership that continue to manifest today as oppressed and unjust racialized structures. In ancient Roman law, the term res nullius was a term used for things without owners, like wild animals, lost slaves, or abandoned buildings. Res nullius were things that could be lawfully taken. The British justified taking of Australian lands as terra nullius, or nobody's land. They didn't make any treaties with Indigenous Australians, using the excuse that Indigenous Australians were simply not there. Or if they were present, they were maybe more like wild animals than humans. Or if they were humans, they were not quite fully human because they were not properly using the land. Native Australians were simply not assumed, were simply assumed not to have humanity, law, livelihoods, or culture. This assumption legally emptied the land, making land available for appropriation, justifying white colonizers' expulsion, dispossession, dehumanization of indigenous lives, and attempts to extinguish their culture. An important test case taken by Eddie Mabo and others. Uh, indigenous Torres Strait Islanders challenged the legality of Australian Indigenous exclusion from their own lands. After a decade in the courts, the 1992 Mabo versus Queensland judgment rejected the terra nullius principle, restoring native title to land that was wrongfully taken by British settlers. Imperial and colonial powers like Portugal, Spain and Britain depended on military, territorial, and economic expansion to continue the extraction of energy and materials needed for capitalist accumulation. Imperial powers like Britain developed ideas of scientific conservation to ensure access to colonial resources when these became scarce, such as timber in India, not conservation of the trees or animals per se. During this period, Deforestation tended to be blamed on peasants and local communities for using the forest for survival needs such as fuel, fodder for the animals, food or medicine. After Indian independence, post -colonial, the post-colonial state continued these patterns of exclusion and dispossession. Commercial and industrial interests were given precedence over the needs of peasants, pastoralists and artisans whose everyday needs were classed as crimes, and this caused ongoing tensions and conflicts to the present day. So colonial expulsion continues today by a process of green grabbing, or even blue grabbing where oceans are concerned, creating emptied spaces seemingly without users. These can be used for conservation or tourism while dispossessing local communities of resources. So as the situation of neo-colonial forestry shows, the extractive and dispossessing logic of colonization continues on long after the governments who exercise authority over these lands have become politically decolonized. Within a globalized system of capitalism and increased demands for capitalist economic accumulation, economic growth, and economic development, the requirement for materials and energy for land, minerals, 
fuel, timber, water, and other natural resources can only become fiercer. Lands devoted to colonial plantations producing capitalist agricultural commodities continue to expand. 500 years after the beginning of European colonization, sugar is still one of the top global agricultural exports today, along with soya, grain, meat fed on soya and grain, and fossils and fossil fuels and fossil fuel derived chemicals used to increase the efficiency of colonial extraction via monocultures. The footprint of land conversions, water use, carbon emissions, and toxic pollution is continuing to increase beyond the carrying capacity of our planet Earth as a whole, with the worst effects being felt by those who have contributed least to the problem and who have suffered the most dispossession. Jason Hickel points out that global atmosphere is a commons, and it is currently being treated like a colony. The struggle against climate breakdown must take into account the colonial appropriation of resources and pollution that accumulated colonial fortunes at the greatest expense to indigenous and colonized people. Thus, the struggle against climate change must be a struggle for climate justice and against colonization. The dispossession and extractive use of indigenous lands has led to both physical as well as cultural destruction. This is arguably no less than genocide, since when indigenous people, who not only have physical but also cultural and spiritual connections to land, are forcibly dispossessed, and when they are dispossessed, they invariably experience social death, as Damien Short says in his book, Redefining Genocide. Material processes of colonization have not slowed down since the period of political decolonization. They have actually intensified and speeded up in the era of globalized capitalist expansion and scaled up commodity chains. <laughs>